Hey, Cut the Shit listeners. You can find every episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Go check us out. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, COO here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I'm very excited to have our very own Stephen Zier as our guest. For the past almost three years, Stephen has served as Plow's Senior Network Architect, where he has shown great skill in handling some of the most difficult architecture and remediation issues our clients could throw at him. Stephen has over 10 years of pure network engineering experience and almost 25 years in IT, having gotten his start as the systems admin for his local school system while he was still in high school. As you will see in the interview, Stephen is a deep thinker, a real expert on all things networking, and pretty damn insightful when it comes to connecting the dots on the role networks play in the larger tech ecosystem. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Stephen Zier. Stephen, welcome to Cut the Shit. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. See you're in the office. It's exciting. Glad to see you're there. Uh, anybody else there today? Uh, just Cameron. Just Cameron. Yeah. You never know on a Monday. Uh, I think Mondays are usually pretty light, so um, it should be quiet. Uh, and if Brian's not there, then it'll be even qui- it'll be much quieter. Um, uh, I've, I've stolen Brian's office. Uh, yes, you have. Yes, you have. Um, again, glad you could come on today. Uh, appreciate you being on to help us think through some of this network stuff, um, given your background and experience. But before we dive into the meat of the discussion, um, how about we start with just to kind of get things going. Can you give us an example of an interesting use of technology? It's got maybe a hack, maybe not. Um, that you've seen or or witnessed lately? It doesn't have to be at work. It could be at home. It could be anything. Uh, The rise of generative AI. I know that's a buzzy word, but the rise of it being able to take massive amounts of data and you just ask it a question and it produce a usable result for a human is a hack that people haven't embraced yet. Have you been using it at all? I use it to go, all right, how would you do X, Y, and Z as a network senior network professional? How would you write a run book for this? And jump from there. I use it uh, as a more advanced version of Google. And so far, have you, have you found it to be, I know James, uh, one of your colleagues on the engineering team, his, I think his description of, of the responses he's gotten for most of his queries has been, these are scarily good. <laughs> Have you had a similar experience? Uh, it's scarily good as of weeks ago. I mean, so it started uh, this whole adventure, you know, sometime mid last year. It didn't cite its sources, and now you can use Gemini, and it will cite its sources, where it got its information, what it extracted it, what it synthesized it from, and then give you the confidence interval of how good that result is. So if you say, hey, write me a run book to upgrade a Cisco cat switch running this code from this code, it will even go so far as to loosely check the upgrade matrix and make suggestions. I mean, it puts boilerplate at the bottom, but it also tells you where it got its sources from. So right. eerily, it has become a good starting point. I don't would not suggest anyone trust it as a sole means of operator. Sure. But if you are inexperienced with something you're trying to do or being tasked with, either at work or in your day-to-day life, it is a good way to frame the question, get the question framed through a systems view. And then if you have additional questions, well, now you have new generated buzzwords that you didn't know before to go and assault the Google. So it takes your Google Foo to the next level. Even if you were already good at Google Foo, it gives you Google foo on something that you don't have a frame of reference. It generates the frame so that you can get a reference point. Even if it's 50% wrong, the other 50% gets you to the next step. Yeah. It's a good starting point for sure. Yeah. I think that's kind of the way I think that's, and and it's going to keep getting better because you just drew, you drew an sort of a time-based comparison compared to middle of last year, as an example, to where we are today in terms of seeing improvements. I think we're going to keep seeing that. So um, something to keep an eye on for sure. And, and we're going like everybody else looking for ways to integrate it into the company, right? Where, where can it help us? 
where can we get better at doing what we do with the folks that we have? Right. So uh, um, we're, we're, we're piloting ticket queuing. Yep. So it's a thing right. that we're doing here at the company We're but we are doing so in a, I would say, sane and logical manner. We're not, Oh, well, AI can solve all of our woes. Let's just ignore sure. the, the human aspect of requirements. Um, but it can give us an edge, right? It can give us a force multiplier in some degrees, unless it goes haywire. Yeah. I mean, that's always, you always know, but uh, you know, I I think, you know, not to get off track, but you know, our value proposition, right. Is at the end of the day, we want to have smart folks who understand and can solve hard problems. Right. And so if we can find a way to leverage, um, you know, AI to help us, solve less hard problems more quickly so we can focus on harder problems with the resources we have that should stand us in good stead. Right. And so that's kind of how I think of it. Uh, and I think the ticket queuing, uh, example is a, is a good one, right? Spending time on that. That's not a hard problem, but it's a time consuming problem, right? So if we can figure that one out, right, then someone doesn't have to spend time doing that. We remove that opportunity cost. They can go focus on something else. So, um, you know, looking for more use cases like that, I think is where, where we'll be spending our time for sure. And and I know you guys are as well on the network side. So, all right. So that's gotten us, uh, I think, where we want to jump into or warmed up now. Um, so let's get to the main event. Uh, so to get us started, um, give us a quick thumbnail sketch on your background and kind of how you got to the role you're in today. Sure. Let's see. I started in technology when I was 16. So I started... I started flipping packets instead of flipping burgers um, when I was in high school. So I worked for the school system I was in. I kind of turned it into a a small microscopic business. Uh, Lawyers, real estate agents around town. I went to school and got my degree in computer information systems from MTSU. I did a small stint in uh, e-discovery. So that was kind of interesting. Then I kind of came around through that to Nexus to kind of really basically solidify my position as networking. And so for the past decade, I've been doing nothing but networking. So I started my career out in jack of all trades, wouldn't even call it the systems administrator because I did the network, I did the wireless, I did systems, I did system design, I did server, you name it, jack of all trades, master of absolutely none. To I'm more focused in the domain of networking. So I've worked in banking and healthcare verticals and ISP verticals. And so then that lands me back here with you guys. Yeah, this is to get the band back together exercise, right? Um, in terms of uh, uh, with, with Ryan, some guys you'd worked with before. That is correct at Nexus. Very good. Very good. All right. So. So let's start with the basics, right? So keeping in mind, like this is not a this is not a network podcast, right? We've got folks that listen who know a lot about networks. We've got people who don't know anything about networks other than they know what it's supposed to, you know, they know what a network is supposed to do. Um, so why don't we start with what exactly does, because even people who work with us, I think don't necessarily really understand what network management really means, what it is. So Let's start there. What does network monitoring and management, what does it actually entail, right? And and then why should somebody care about it in the sense of beyond, well, it just needs to work, right? That's a dumb, that's, that's such a statement of the obvious that it's not worth bothering with. Yeah, I'd separate those two into two different kind of silos, right? You got monitoring is in the broadest sense, do the lights blink and should they continue to blink? So if you've got an internet connection, it's blinking. It's up, it's working, it's happy, you're on it, we're talking over it right now. Right? Monitoring is the aspect of, I want to keep what I have today doing what I have today. Right? I want status quo maintained. When you think of management, okay, that takes it to the next level, which is I want to also maintain it. I don't want to just keep the lights blinking. I want to keep software patched. I want to take better best practices as I move forward. I need to right size my network as I move through this process, meaning 
I may need to go back and prune a circuit or add a circuit or my, minor changes, not topology changes. That would be design and architecture, but small things, day-to-day -day operations, management. So I keep the you keep the upgrades running. You keep the software up to date. You keep best practices applied. You respond to incidents, right? Whether that be a circuit outage or that be a CVE, right? A critical vulnerability that you have on your network asset, especially towards the edge, that's really a management function, right? We got to go in, we have to make a change. We got to do it very quickly, very effectively. And we have to make sure we maintain good posture. That would be a management function. So I kind of look at them in two different veins. Your um, up down monitoring you know, is monitoring. It's, is it blinking? Is it not blinking? Do you have power? Do you not have power? They're very binary choices. Management is where you get into the, okay, well, it's up and it's, it's working, but if you say the word but, you've now entered the, the realm of management, right? You want something more. Right. And monitoring, I mean, there's, there's what you describe, which I'd call real-time monitoring or in the moment monitoring, right? And then there's overtime monitoring, right? Which is what, it, which you can glean some, you can glean some insights from, I would assume in terms of, an, of terms of network performance, but that presupposes you're putting on a management hat, right? That you're paying attention to it because again, real-time monitoring or in the moment has no thought of the history, has no thought of the future, right? Which is the potential degradation, the, you know, there's potential things that need, you know, you've got, <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's a, there's an equipment and an infrastructure that a network is relying on that at any given moment may be just fine, but that doesn't mean it'll stay that way. Right. I mean, there's entropy, there's degradation, there's stuff that breaks all that good stuff. That's that all falls into the management bucket at that point in terms of why you try to handle these other things proactively and reactively. Right. Yeah. I look at in the moment monitoring is monitoring, right? Everything else is kind of site reliability questions, which is still under the umbrella of network management, and performance, right? Those, those kind of live as ancillary, right? Think of it an alert. Monitoring is designed around getting you an alert. Is something broken? Does a human need to actu actually do something right this second? Yes, I need to dispatch a guy. Okay, that's a monitoring alert. We need to do something with it. Is it degraded but functional? As in, did we fail over to a, a, a circuit or are we taking packet loss? That's a heuristics conversation. I don't need a person to actively engage at two in the morning on that issue. I need them to be aware of that issue. The site had a, site had a reliability question mark. Right. That's an analytical question for them to go through and go, okay, well, then answer the question, why? Right. Oh, well, Comcast was doing maintenance or, you know, they had packet loss or it's within the SLA sort of things. Answer the question, close out that ticket. Yeah. See that ticket repetitively? Okay, it's more heuristic. It's more, it's more signal against the noise that hey, there's something going on with that particular site. Somebody needs to dig deeper at that point. Yeah, that's where the human, human aspect comes into play, right? Oh, I've seen this five times at this particular site. That's not a coincidence. Right. That's not five maintenance periods, right? That's every night at two in the morning. Something why are we getting on. this? Right. Why are we getting this non-actionable informational alert? sent out to us yeah. we don't need to take action on, but we need to investigate. Right. Gotcha. Okay. So not switching gears, but a question related to sort of more probably management, but I guess a little bit monitoring since they do go together. I mean, obviously management requires monitoring. You need that, right. That feeds the management piece of the puzzle. Um, are there some examples or what's happening innovation wise that's making this job easier in terms of monitoring and management? So in monitoring, there are lots of, there, there's an interesting tools. We use a tool called AVIC. So that is more of a monitor, man, monitor to a management tool. So it will tell you, Hey, a site's up or a site's down. But if you then put your management hat on, it'll tell you, Oh yeah. And it's connect. That item is connected to these five items. So it'll give you intelligence. Right. So you can make an intelligent assessment of, well, I have a downed router. Well, that tells me the whole site's going to be down. <laughs> right. 
but I can make that a one bundled up alert, right? So then the operator can then go look at that and go, okay, I don't need to be worried with these 12 other alerts. This one alert is the alert that really matters. So getting to the root as quickly as possible, right? That's what two, the tool sets are getting into now. And they're getting into automation and they're getting into a little bit of AI automation at that, where if you see a X, Y, and Z problem and you know what a, you can do as your first five steps, it can try those first five steps. So do some self-healing using a, using automation or AI automation, sort of using smart, uh, yeah, smart, uh, you know, if-thens, I guess, around that. Yeah, pretty much. Some of, there are some tools that are around that are doing that. Anything making it harder? Anything making it harder? Well, I mean, compared to, you know, maybe five years ago, you know, or, or you know, looking backwards where, and maybe that's a dumb question, but I'm just curious, like, sometimes technology and innovation helps and sometimes it makes things more complex or there could have been changes just in the, in the broader ecosystem that have made it harder. I think the acceptance of, Hey, something is broken has changed. Right. So that, that, that underlying, Hey, that site's down. It has no internet. Maybe six years ago that would have been, okay, that's bad. You know, it, it hurts our business. And now it's one of, well, it's an all out absolute now, right? And this is uh, this is not really a monitoring or management. It's more of a management question, right? Is if you're managing network, which includes site reliability, it's a conversation that you have to have, which is what does it mean if your site has an issue? And just imagine you're going to have an issue. So the user space has changed. Not so much the delivery space or the monitoring space. Most of that's remained static and not gotten worse. It's the ever-increasing requirement that that object work yeah. has gone I mean, it's, up. It's like turning the lights on, right? In, I mean, the expectation that, that the electricity will always be there, right? It feels the same to me for, uh, for connectivity. Yeah, when I started in technology, connectivity was a luxury item. Uh, everything was designed around no connectivity. And now it's not a luxury item. It's, it's like water. The water has to come out of the tap. And so everyone has shifted around connectivity as a requirement. Right. So we've got a 180 degree turn in technology in the last 20, 25 years to a sense of if you aren't connected, you aren't doing anything. Right. You can't work like we, you know, there's that it's pencils down. And, and even for me to say pencils down shows how old I am. Right. That's that doesn't even mean anything to, to, to most people these days. But that's you know what I'm saying? It's the assumption that I cannot do anything. Right. Which. I mean, isn't true, but is true. Right. It's one of those perception is reality at this point. And there are so many, you know, Internet enabled or connectivity enabled services that people use in their jobs that only peeling back to, well, I can work on this Word document that I don't need to be online for, for. It's almost like a mind shift, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, and it, that's that's what's made things, I wouldn't say more difficult, but I would say more interesting because that mind shift hasn't made it through all of the organizations. Um, understanding that, well, if you have two, you only have one, and you need to be really ready to use have two, right? And you really need more than one of things. That cost paradigm and that relational co cost to to productivity hasn't that relationship hasn't made it through all the organizations. Sure. Which, what you say makes it more difficult is the assumption that it will always be working, <laughs> and that this magical AI that you may or may not be using to fix things can make things better, and thus soft by their way out of yeah i don't need the i don't need the i don't need to i don't need redundancy because you know the magic's gonna fix it yeah it'll never go down right or if it does the you know the the robots will fix it so fast that no one will know kind of a thing and i mean you know maybe we can get into it for just a bit but you know my perspective on you know what i'd call the wholesale side of connectivity so the carriers and the delivery you know, the, the infrastructure itself for getting connectivity to the, you know, to the last mile, to the, to the store or to the office 
or to the home, you know, the home site where someone's working remotely, that particular infrastructure <laughs> is is complicated. Maybe that's the best word I can think of to describe it. And I'm not sure it's really ready for the the expectations that people have uh, along the, the along the description for what you just described, which is it should always be on. It should never go down, right? I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, that our our experience tells us it's not, right? I mean, stuff goes down every day, right? Comcast goes down, AT and T goes down, whoever's providing circuits to offices, right? This is the way. It's not that consistent in the sense. I mean, it's highly consistent. I don't mean that it doesn't work most of the time, but if it's supposed to work all the time, that's very different than working most of the time or almost all the time. Yeah, I, w- I would say that the core infrastructure, as well, separate it, has achieved a resiliency status internally that is, in essence, nine, six sigma nines. It is as good as the power company. Problem is that one pole that you hit, that the drunk driver hit at yep. two in the morning, happened to hold AT and T, Comcast, CenturyLink. All of your majors used the same pole to get into your facility. Yep. And you didn't plan for that instance. That's what I mean. The physical variations in that in the delivery of connectivity are almost impossible to bring to the same level of, of <clears throat> expectations that you described as for the core infrastructure. I, I, you know, five years ago, I was, we were all telling people, Hey, LTE is so great. You should have a backup. 5g is coming. Here's 5g. You know, now I just tell people, forget it. Slap a Starlink on your roof and be done with it. At this point, you're, you're getting to the point where you're exactly right. Just don't trust the local terrestrial area you're at. If you have to be on, well, then you have to be on in literally non-terrestrial ways. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I think that the problem is that the, the cost, the cost picture for that isn't pretty t- so far. It might change. And I, I have a question about 5G because I want to ask you about that um, relative to Wi-Fi. It's gotten a lot better, actually. Um, you know, you can get Starlink for more much much more than you can pay for LTE at, on an on bucket consumption demand problem, right? But it's 150 bucks. If you've got to be up that, you know, 1800 dollars a year is an insurance policy. Sure, it's, che- it's the cheapest insurance policy money can buy when it comes to connectivity. Right. So that that's a that is a site reliability conversation that organizations need to have, right? Because the same twister and the same drunk driver that knocked out the pole that feeds your building, well, it feeds the cell site down the street too, right? The the multivariance of physical topology, I don't think will ever rise to the level of anything more than power. And, but we got smart. We have other options, yeah. right? We can beam to space now. That's unheard of. And that's again, it's a, it's an it's a twelve month ago. Every every day, that's the thing that's changing in connectivity, is yeah. how little you need a footprint for where you are. Yeah, and that'll be interesting to watch how that evolves over time, right? Because you know, there's <clears throat> there's a lot of investment tied up in those in those terrestrial lines. Um, you know, that'll create it'll create interesting challenges for for the business and the model. Um, I, I did want to ask you about 5G because I've been reading some about it. Um, obviously, the providers are talking, you know, they're they're talking big about um, the ability to use 5G and others, other maybe other services like it, uh, you know, cellular or well, non 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 corded. Uh, let's call it that way, right? Where you're you're non terrestrial um, options for moving away from Wi-Fi or other kinds of other kinds of connections that don't require wire. I was just curious. It sounds a little bit like hype, but I know that it's not. So I just want to get your take on it. If there's, is there some nuance there that you could share with us? Yeah. So it kind of depends <laughs> on um, what would they consider 5G. So if you're considering, if you're a Verizon customer, ultra wideband UW, you know, high speed versions on T-Mobile, T-Mobile Plus, uh, AT and T's got a copy of it. It, it, that is a, that is a bucket. Then there's 5G. 5G is just LTE. 
But if you're talking true advanced 5G, which is UW, ultra wideband for Verizon, that category, C band or the like, you're talking really high frequency, really short range, lots of channels. Absolutely. Can I set up a Verizon link within a, half, within a mile of its facility and get 200 down and 15 up? Is that as good as a, a store that does a POS needs? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where we are with it. Do I need to have a terrestrial line to that store or can I rely on 5G? Well, I would argue you probably want both. Because the cost on that 5G circuit are minimal. It is, however, not resolved the issue with all things cellular, which is high rates of variability. It's 100% dependent on the area you're in, your signal strength, the utilization of other users in your area. Right. It's the old adage of DSL versus cable all over again, except this time the telecom people are selling the shared line service, cable. And so that distinction is something that we haven't addressed yet or has not been addressed very effectively in installing that. So absolutely, if you have a minimum need and you just need a small connection and your reliability index is within the bounds of an inexpensive 5G service with real 5G, absolutely. It is and my, my, assumption, my assumption is on the Wi-Fi side, there's a bunch of other management tools that are available to that you wouldn't necessarily have in what I'd consider a traditional cellular connectivity service. It'd still have to run through a mediated, I'll call it Wi-Fi-like, at least from a software. So if you're thinking about Meraki or Fortinet or something, right, you manage the Wi-Fi. Um, it's not just that there are these little things all over the office that broadcast out you know, connectivity that, that your machine can get on, right? It's doing more than that. So I guess you'd, we'd need to see something similar, uh, some sort of infrastructure paired with that 5G to, uh, to be able to replicate it, if we were talking about trying to truly skip out on that and move beyond it. Yeah, I, I don't see the rationale of, of moving out of Wi-Fi. You sacrifice so much local service. Um, you sacrifice so much local shared resources. I mean, I don't foresee you wanting to spend the 10 or 12 bucks a month to put your printer on the internet so right. that you can print. Like, it, it's a useful tool for when you're not connected to the office or when you're out of the house or when that's your primary service into the house. As far as directly replacing inner office communication, I don't see them making the strides necessary to make that work. I do see the Wi-Fi Alliance rapidly adopting more cellular-like technologies. So Wi-Fi... That makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say packaging it in, right? Using that as another way to gain connectivity, right? I, I see it more of a, they adopt some of the tried and true options that cellular networks have used, which is more more access channels and network directivity, network being the, 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 the champion and director of who's talking to whom. Gotcha. Those sort of things. So gotcha. those are those are being adopted into Wi-Fi, right? So Wi-Fi really didn't Wi-Fi got a lot better up to four and five and Wi-Fi four and five, but really didn't make the giant leap until six and seven. Six and seven is where you would basically say Wi-Fi took over again. So it's getting more of a centralized footprint to the access point, right? It's, it's regaining its power in the network. Are we to the point, and, and this is a question, you know, I don't know this, as you think about the installations and some of the company work that you've seen recently, are is everyone still, uh, you know, um, running low volt, low voltage for uh, computers to be able to plug into the network? Or are you seeing, are you seeing less of that? Um, as as new you know as new locations get built out, with the assumption that Wi-Fi is going to be what we're going to use, I still see people covering their bases by running out low voltage to the desk side. I, however, have heard people getting to the point with Wi-Fi six and seven to moving to no wired or wired reduced footprints. Yeah. 
That's what I was going to say. Not zero. Obviously, you're going to you want to plug your printer in. There's things you would want to do, but I was just curious about um, even some cubicles. So they're going to the to the cubicles with wired connectivity. People who are doing lots of voice and video and this sort of activity. Try where latency is a big issue as a as a potential issue. That kind of thing. Correct. Versus the the cubicles where they're hot desking and coming in and bringing in their laptop, connecting it to power and the monitor, and that's that. Gotcha. And that allows for actually a more interesting concept, which is it allows for architecture to be more mobile in the office space. Yep. Meaning I can set up a cubicle farm that's not, or a cubicle area that's not linear. It doesn't have to be a straight line or a star pattern or, or centered around a pole. Or right. I can do more interesting architectural changes in the environment that better suit functional functionality for work because I no longer need wires. And a lot of that is twofold. One, realizing that bandwidth, anything over 100 megs is basically good enough for a user right now. Yep. And two, that some latency is mostly okay. I and mean, you can have, we're having a video call right now and it's wireless. Yeah, and I'm on a, I'm on a 100 meg, you know, local service at my house, right? And it's, it's as far as I can tell, no issues, right? To your point, it's completely, it's more than adequate. It's, it's, it, I wouldn't, I don't need any more, you know? Yeah, it's, and as Wi Fi progresses forward where it's more in charge, it is better able to enforce that reliability and lower the bandwidth, but maintain that reliability for users. Yeah. And a reliable connection for a user is paramount way more than bandwidth. So if you can keep that connection stable, relatively similar jitter space, or which is the time between it takes to, to transverse a, a packet to the same destination, jitter, if that's more of a even curve, then users don't know the difference. Right. In fact, they embrace it. Yeah, because it's they don't have to worry about, I mean, you don't have to worry about being plugged in. I mean, there's a lot of, sim- there's a lot of simplicity that comes with you know, the knowing that you can just drop down and do whatever you need to do wherever you are um, in the office, in this case, since we're talking about a physical location. Uh, but to your point, that same expectation gets carried then with that user everywhere they go. They go and they jump on some Wi-Fi at a coffee shop and they're frustrated because it doesn't, you know, they can't have the same experience because that's they've gotten used to it, right? And that's a, that's a you know, that's a double-edged sword. It's good news, bad news of the situation, right? So... Yeah, not, not all Wi-Fi is created equal. No. I, mean, I think that is that is something that is another one of those misconceptions that I think has been overcome finally. Because I think the, the the feeling has always been, oh, well, the mall Wi-Fi and the coffee shop Wi-Fi is awful. How could you ever do the density of an office complex when, you, when it's unachievable at a Starbucks? Right. And that's just the adage of, well, they didn't exactly design for 300 people. We can design for 300 people right. and that experience be as good or better and better in the sense of mobility than a wired connection, right? We can make it plus. Right. And, and people come in and that has been a difficult thing that Wi-Fi itself has had to overcome with uh, people who are the network operators, network management, and executive staffs and organizations. And then you can see like the Google office complexes, which have completely embraced this philosophy. They have almost no wire jacks. You would yeah. think Google have, having all these wire jacks, they're building all their new office space basically around, centered Wi-Fi. around the concept of user first architecture. Yeah. Mobile, and then the network mobile, just movement. has to figure yeah. it out. Right. Yeah. Which is, you know, kind of a metaphor if you think of, in my mind for the idea of remote work, right, and work anywhere, right? That's that the whole definition of a network in your career has changed, right? A network used to be framed around a physical location or set of locations, right? And now it's that plus <laughs> wherever anybody is, right? It's a it's basically a set of nodes, right? People that are that that are have you know the rights to credential access, right? Uh, and and it might involve co- your connectivity, it might involve somebody else's, but uh, the network is really broader than, you know, the three buildings that you used to have, you know, the whole walled garden and all that in really envisioned a physical space uh, with limits, and it doesn't anymore. 
Yeah, the, the network is no longer a fabric footprint you can put your hands on. Yep. And it's now a sense of righted access, user space, et cetera. That user may be on Starlink in the middle of Wyoming, sitting next to a lake. You don't know. I mean, you know by the IP address that they're on Starlink, but you don't know where they are. Right. right? That aspect has changed just in the past year. I'd say in the past five years, it's been, hey, you can be mobile. Some of that's a social economic change with more remote work, but that wouldn't have worked if the network underlying technologies had been ready to take stage. Sure. The network sure. Was, was ready to take the main center stage when it was needed, right? So now you have, now it's been exposed and it's on the main stage and it's shown itself to be, we can work for you, you can work at your basic job anywhere you need to be. If you need to be on site today, you can be on site today. If you need to be home, you need to be in the car. The broader network has taken main stage and has come, come to fruition and said, all right, here we go. We can do this for you. Now we've See? shifted towards a, access model of yeah yeah and i was going to say that that's an interesting it, it, it leads to this question i wanted to ask because <clears throat> you know I'm, I'm old enough to remember in general when you talked about security you know it security that meant network security right that that's what security was um but that that's that's not the case anymore and in fact you know network security is a is a piece of a broader puzzle um and so as you think about that, I, I, you're not a security, um, you're not a security expert, but you live, you, you know, you can't you can't work in networks and not think about security, right? This is this is part of the game. Um, what 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 is network security today, and how should companies be thinking about it as they consider this sort of broader, you know, picture of security issues? Keeping in mind, you've got zero trust. Again, where you were using sort of traditional knowledge work. I don't mean, you know the local Starbucks and what's going on there. I'm talking about, you know, where you've got these broader, you've got these broader challenges. Where do you see network security fitting in and how should people be thinking about it? I think people should be thinking about their network security as essential, as essential as the internet that they have today. If you've got lights, if you're, if the lights are blinking, you need to make sure that there's a guard for those lights. You have the internet, you should just imagine that someone is out there trying to figure out how to get through your security. So that what does that mean? That means you need to keep your hardware up to date. You need to use hardware that's supportable. And then you need to get to best practices, which is don't make yourself an easy target. Don't leave things exposed on the outside of the internet without security, even basic security. I'm only talking to so-and-so, right, from a management standpoint. From a user space standpoint, you need to imagine that your users are everywhere and nowhere all at once. Meaning, if you have a VPN, you're going to have access to everything they have inside and vice versa. What are you going to do about that? My network road is going to roll out across Starlink to Wyoming. It's also going to roll out to the desk right around the corner from the closet. And those experiences are going to be almost the same. If it's done correctly, they are the same. Okay, you feel you have security because they're in your building. The person out in Wyoming sitting by the stream is not in your building. So that moves to an identity and access management credential conversation, which definitely exits network security. But I think we work hand in hand. Yeah, they're hip, they're they're share they're kissing cousins, right? They're right together. You have no choice in my mind but to think about them at the same time, right? In this sense. Yeah, you have to think about the fact that I have provided a road of access. This is a very similar road to the road to sitting at the cubicle. That's what's required to necessity. That's a necessity that is required to make the business function. That being said, we do a we we have a lot better understanding of how to secure that desk, right? Well, they're coming in a trusted source. They're in the building. They were badged access. We have a lot of, I don't want to say dogma, but a lot of dogma associated with, oh, well, they're in the office. That makes it inherently better and more secure. When in reality, they're connected to the same piece of hardware in Wyoming. Right. In this scenario. And they're getting the same experience. So from a network's perspective, 
You want to make sure that user is really that user? Well, I got to have my friends in IAM to make sure. You want to make sure that user in the office is going to the right places? Your security team has to tell me what is acceptable. We have to work that out. It's negotiation, right? The network is here to function as a security tool. We so are not security. Along that, along those lines, help me understand the concept of segmentation within this framework. Like, what what does that mean? And what, what's a you know this? I think this is a this for me. You know, as a former CIO, I understood kind of at a generic level what that means. But I think I think the people listening, it would be helpful to understand from a network engineering perspective what is segmentation and what would it look like. And I know it's different business by business, but give me some examples so we understand that a little bit better and why it's important. Segmentation is the single most important thing that a network team can do with res- with regards to good network security. Period. It is the number one thing. There's there's a concept called micro segmentation, but I'll leave that to the side. Actual segmentation, really generic at a high level. I've got one network that is my users. That's everyone with a desk or a VPN. We don't really trust you. You you like to do things and go to places on the internet that we don't really like. But we don't really have control, right? That laptop has got has got legs. It walks out of the building, and then it walks back in. I don't know what it walks back in with. We can do the very best we can, but at any given day, it's going to walk in with something we don't like. Segmentation says that the network that runs my servers are very, very guarded. They have additional layers of firewall access and conditional access applied to them that says, yeah, you're on the VPN. You know you're in the office. It doesn't matter to us. It's the original concept of zero trust. Right. So zero trust is a is something different. This is the original concept of it. It's segmentation. Essentially, it's exactly the same, right? Correct. Yeah. But this is this is where it comes from. Okay, my server farm lives in a very isolated patch. It has its own network, it has its own control structure around it. That control structure defines who can call it, how they can call it, and what those conversations can be about. Also, it gives you a single point to just log in and shut it off. At any moment, if you think one of your user land spaces brought the plague with them into the office, you don't have to wait. You can just rip the cord, and the servers can keep running. But we can disconnect them soft from the rest of the network while whatever incident goes on to protect ourselves. Mitigation, potential mitigation if there's an issue, right? That's the mitigation aspect. Second aspect is if you go even deeper, those are what we would a demilitarized zone or DMZ or what we would call, I'd call it the gray space, right? It can talk to user space and it can talk to deep server space. Right. So you have server space that's kind of a gray area. Then I would say you got your back end or deep server space land where PII data is stored, HIPAA controlled data is stored, PCI data is stored. That's where you want that stored. Why? It can't talk to the internet unless you let it for an update. It can't talk to users directly. It has to go through a middleman. And that in- inherently gives you even more granular control over right. what those transactions and who can make them and who can read them, et okay. cetera. That helps. So that's the segmentation. Again, that's where, to me, it feels like it's such a strong matchup with you know, identity and access management, right? Because privilege access management, that sort of thing sort of depends on good segmentation, right? I mean, it, it doesn't have to, I guess it doesn't have to, but it's it works hand in glove with it. Oh, absolutely. Because if you have good IAM, that defines who can call the server in the first place. Right, right. And then if they if there's if someone has to approve it, right, there's a you get you get double you get sets of eyes on things, right? There's a there's a the the chances of nefarious, you know, access go way down. The chance of stale access goes down. Um, timed access with IAM is really critical to an organ to larger organizations, and it's something larger organizations do do. Uh, when I worked in the banking vertical, that was a strong concept. If you got root administrative access to a given box, that was only good for six months to a year. Right. It had to be constantly refreshed and renewed because stale access is the number one killer from an IAM perspective. 
because if I have a user who has elevated access out in the po- out in the pond, and then they no longer need it, that's a threat vector of what we call high trust that's sitting out there that can access my high trust environment. Yeah, with unnecessary risk. Equivalent of an open port that someone opened and forgot to close, right? And then somebody finds it, right? And everyone's forgotten about it. Yes, this, this is a very common concept. Yeah. The well, I don't use that firewall rule anymore and not pruning it. Um, when you have segmented APTA, that is in the, the knee jerk reaction when there's a problem is to drop your segmented access, right? Is to just basically make a firewall policy that just says, I don't care, make it work. The yeah. business is the one who usually drives that conversation. And then God's not drive the responding conversation of, okay, let's put it back where we found it. Right. We, 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 we fixed whatever the issue was. Now we need to go back to good practice, right? So, Correct. Yeah. The reversion and to you, good practice is, is a little rough. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned firewalls a couple of times. And so before I, I, I want to be mindful of time and wrap up, but uh, firewalls are another one that um, I think are, there's, it's an interesting you know, piece of equipment, software, you know, software enabled equipment, whatever you want to call it. Right. <clears throat> at, at least again, I'm old. So I tend to think of firewalls as security devices, right? Because that's, they were, you know, at least the way I always envisioned it, right. You put them in front of your, in front of your equipment so that the network would then be filtered in and out to keep out the bad guys or try to minimize bad shit happening. Right. I mean, that's a very simplistic description, but in many ways, that's the sort of the original iteration of a firewall. Right. Um, but they obviously do lots of other things. So maybe under, help us understand, give us a little bit more, uh, a broader perspective on the role that a firewall plays inside a network. Because what I just gave you was like the kindergarten or maybe even preschool version. I know, I know we could do better than that. Yeah, so uh, you can imagine a firewall is a, is, a, is a cop, right? Is what you described. He polices the network coming in, coming out. But we can take it from the basics of, I can talk to the internet on port, HTTPS to only certain websites. Well, that, that's a small upgrade in next generation. We can also evaluate packets and look for signatures as they come in and out and say, well, that looks a lot like the packet for insert malicious activity and stop that. I also look at a firewall as kind of the, the crown jewel of any network. So it is the crown jewel of the network. If you're coming in or you're coming out, you can't get past me. I will see you, which means I have complete 2020 vision in what we would call north-south or in and out of a data center or in and out of any facility. I can see where you're going and who's responding to you. I can even take that information and make rules about it now and say, okay, I really don't want you talking to insert country, or I can say, ah, uh, We've had way too much YouTube with this facility. Let's cut it off. Firewalls are the tool used to police user space while also keeping keen eye on what those users are doing should an incident arise. So good logging and good practices, even for traffic you're letting move through your network, that's where that information comes from. It comes from a firewall. Segmentation firewall, same thing. Who's talking to and from a server? Who's talking to and from the database? Right? Which? And so you can draw when you have an incident or just under general flow, what's going on? To take you back to management all the way from the beginning of this conversation, what does this information do? It allows you to be a better manager of that network. Because if I know how much bandwidth you're using or going to a given location, I can make better informed suggestions and say, well, you know, your primary circuit, which is very expensive, is using a lot of YouTube traffic. So I give you two options here. You can be the person who turns that off and makes your employees less happy, or you have this perfectly good backup circuit over here that's doing absolutely nothing during any given day. We can make that traffic and move it, right? Because the firewall with software-defined WAN, which is a super common feature this day, these day and age, especially with our Fortinet firewalls here, I can just move that traffic. Right. I can just pick it up and stick it on the circuit that you're not Point doing it over anything there. with. Yeah, you, go, you, you just route it, right? You just move it over there instead of this way, right? Put a fork in the road. Small management change saved you on buying a bigger circuit, but also allowed you not to be the draconian person who said, oh, we're not going to allow this in our network. Right. 
right? You're on a guest network, right? Users are going to do what users are going to do, but understanding what your users do with the information you can get out of a firewall and build reports off of can inform you of what management decisions you should make, whether those be corporeal in the flesh decisions, like is it an administrative decision you need to make, or can we make an IT decision instead that will achieve the same end of right. reducing the bandwidth on the very expensive circuit that we need for business use? Right. And so that's what a firewall, that's just a little bit of what a firewall can do for you. That helps though. Cause I think, again, I do think it, you know, contextually speaking, it's, it's easy to get locked in on, you know, it's just for blocking or, you know, and, and, and that's obviously an important part of it, but it's much broader than that. I, I think in my day-to-day -day use of a, of a firewall blocking is the last thing I use it for in this day yeah. and age. That's what I figured. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do a lot of firewall. We, we write policies. Don't get me wrong, but Steering traffic or yeah, it's much more traffic management, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the firewall is turned into a very advanced traffic cop. Yeah. Makes sense. Whereas that that role used to only be exclusively the dominion of a router, right? Or a switch. It's it's taken on three things of duties and then layered on security on top. Yeah. So if you wonder why they're quite expensive and why they're oversized in, in most of your deployments, it's because if you don't have any headroom, you'll run out of it quickly. It's the one network appliance device that a little bit of overkill pays off three years later when your organization has a, a bandwidth utilization shift, right? So if you go back to COVID, a lot of organizations had what I would call right-sized firewalls. They were 80% utilization. Yep. Now you got to run VPNs on that. And everybody needs to hit it. And it didn't work. <laughs> and you got to run three times the amount of bandwidth you had yesterday. Yeah. That's where the, that's where the initial shortages came from. The company I used to work for as a bank, we went from, oh, 80% utilization to 300% utilization. And having to respond to that demand and having no headroom left us with having to actually put physical hardware in the rack and not just upgrade a circuit. So giving yourself headroom when you select firewalls and edge equipment is absolutely vital to giving you good management capabilities. Right, right. Yeah, that's the raw material. It doesn't mean you'll be good at management, but you, you can't be good at management without it. Exactly. You can't make good decisions without the hardware under your, your feet, so to speak. Yeah. You can't, you, can't drive, you can't drive in the right direction if you don't have a car that can get down the road. Um, and that's, that's kind of a common tactic. So let's, let's close out here. Um, it's sort of a forward looking question. You know, as you look ahead, what excites you about the next two to three years when you think about the space? I think distributed networking is going to become a more and more common thing. So for instance, the fact that you can get in three years, potentially if, if project Kuiper takes off, multiple satellite providers for internet 5g will become a more common thing the concept of decentralized access will be kind of hitting its stride which is you don't need to be in an office you don't need to be at home you can be anywhere you need to be and have more than enough ample amount of bandwidth which then drives the iotification which is a buzzy term but it hasn't really gained traction until now. LTE and the cheapness of getting an LTE modem in a 5G universe is going to allow the cheap access for anything and everything. And it's going to drive more and more and more access, right? Five years ago, you bought a car, 10% of them had a, a cellular modem in them. Today, every one of them got a modem. Right. And what does that mean for the user access and for you as the me as the consumer? Well, it means you you have an evolved platform. AI can now come to it. Having commoditized bandwidth at a cheap rate allows you access to all of the other things that yeah. are exciting in technology. Yeah, it creates the it creates the platform, the raw materials for that. Right. It, the you know the answer is what's it going to do. Well, the answer to that is 
who knows, right? It's going to do a lot, right? <laughs> it, it just opens up the world for innovation in, in terms of those, in terms of that, in terms of those tools, right? Like late '90s when you know so much money got poured into the into the sort of the infrastructure side of the house, right? In terms of building out the internet, was it an overbuild at the time? Yeah, it was, but it ended up paying off huge dividends for us as we moved into the 2000s, right? Um, you know, some people. Some companies went bankrupt, or whatever, and it's over. You know, they overspent on stuff, but that's what gave us the modern internet, right? <laughs> Without it, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had the SaaS companies, we wouldn't have had the cloud, we wouldn't have had what 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 we evolved to, right? Or maybe, or certainly not in the span of time that we did. Um, and that that redu- reduction of cost in this case, or in that case, the overinvestment that led to ubiquity or uh, you know significant investment made it possible. So it seems to be the same here. All right, I want to switch gears for you before we go to the last question. And so thinking about that same question, next two to three years, what worries you or what scares you? Well, it's, this is going to sound like a broken record, but I mean, look at AI. It's not a network thing. It's networks are relatively going to become like highways. We pave them, we repave them, we make them bigger, we compact, we compact them, we get better with security. Quantum security is a thing. We, we have most of the road infrastructure for the next 10 years is well understood. What we don't understand is what's going on those roads. And the ability of today, Sora, or things from OpenAI that absolutely, if you don't squint hard, can't tell the difference between reality. I basically am the man. I, I'm the management person of the bridge to allow that kind of traffic across. Right. So we built an infrastructure that is staggeringly robust, staggeringly fast. That small changes at the top, AI, have no barriers. They're not. You know, if you think back in the '90s, right. You could make big changes in the data center, but everyone was on a 56K modal. The speed at which that information moved was fast, but it's not like today. Today, you make a change, 40 seconds later, a million people know about it. And it's pushed. They don't have to look for it. It's shoved in their general direction. And that's just taken as a common theme. So having an AI or an AI set of tools that have little to no safety margins around them on a information highway that is incredibly robust that's concerning um and what it can do forgetting a lot of things that people think of right people think to politics or the like fine there's a company that it's already been had for $20 million because someone impersonated an executive. Go to that. Yeah. That's completely, I don't want to say benign, but that's pretty much okay. It's already happened. Now you add three more years to that. And what new safeguards do we have to put in place right. with this sort of interaction to know that you really are at your house and I'm really at the office. Like, those sort of things are advancing at a pace that I, I have never seen. And I've been doing technology for almost 25 years, and I've seen incredible speed, but I've never seen something go from not great to uh, if I didn't squint hard enough, I wouldn't know that wasn't real, and this is the worst it will ever be, and it's going to be worse later. That, that's, uh, in technology, that's the thing that scares you. Yeah, because it it it'll eventually have access to everything, and we're going to give it access to everything willingly. Yeah, that's fair. And and I you know I don't know the answer to that. You know I guess the you know the the optimistic answer or or hope would be that the same tools that we use that could be used for for you know nefarious actions could also be used for good purposes to manage that right or protect ourselves against it. I don't know what that looks like, but in, in much the same way that the internet was built, you know, the, the internet's an open protocol, right? It was not built to be secure. And that's part of why, but so we've spent 20 years now layering on security techniques 
onto an, uh, to a platform that wasn't built for that, right? I mean, it wasn't purpose built to be safe and secure. It was built to be, to just do communication, right? It was, be, it was open by nature. Um, uh, maybe AI, you know, exactly a nuclear holocaust right it was just said you know in case there was a nuclear war we could talk to each other uh, no one was really worried about somebody stealing your credit card or you know any of that kind of crap um no, and, 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 I, and to your to your point i agree with you i think that's going to happen but i fear that well is there a mismatch of time, time right what's what's the what's the time between because we're i mean to your point i think it's i think no one would argue with it that to say where we are, we are at the we are at the very beginning stages of this, right? It is so immature from a an understanding and a, a, a sort of a broader use, you know, uses and and applications. The technology itself, while it may be immature, is breathtakingly powerful, <laughs> and that's it's like uh, it's like taking little kids and you know giving them Ferraris, right? I mean, it's you know they might know how to they might know how to drive their little uh, you know little kitty cars, but they're probably not ready for the you know for the big machines yet. And we have the big machines. I think is you know to use a simplistic metaphor. Our our relationship to networking and the internet was mismatched, but there's a key. We evolved our understanding. We're able to catch up in a period of time that was the cap or the gas, the, the, you know, the cap, the gap was manageable. The chasm between where the internet was and, and the, the understanding of the populace closed quick enough that you didn't end up with some runaway. I think eventually, yes, we will get there. But I, I think our maturity level as a, even practitioners are playing catch such catch up. I cannot imagine if I'm a practitioner of technology, what someone who isn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're, is going to experience. If you're saying that, right, that's way different than the average person walking around, right. Who's just reading an article and it's not, you know, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't mean that they're, it doesn't mean that they're dumb. It has nothing to do with that. It's that, if they're if you're having a hard time getting your head around it, uh, being in the space, so that that makes it doubly or triply or quadruply so for everybody else, right? I mean, it has to be. Yeah, and we've built a network globally to convey this message. Absolutely. At, yeah. At lightning speed. Yeah. At all costs, right? I, I I liken the the internet as it must work, right? It, I mean, it's it's the electrical power grid. There's no, I mean, you, you can't really disaggregate the two in terms of the way we think about them. And in some in some aspects, it's more reliable than the power grid. Right. And and that's the thing. It's it's even more distributed uh, than I think people may realize. Um. And it's become so passive, right? You your access to the to the option or, or whatever it is. If you're looking for Netflix. If Netflix takes an extra three seconds to spend, you think the world has come to an end, right? right? Because you've, 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 you've risen to an understanding or expectation that networks will perform yep. in a certain way. And when they That's don't, right. it's incredibly obvious. When the network people make a mistake, you don't got to tell us. We nope. always know. That's right. Like our Netflix starts spinning first. <laughs> All right, Stephen. I always like to wrap up with something personal. Um, so I'm not personal like that personal, but uh, so I'm going to ask you: um, Can you share something um, that you've watched or read lately that you think others ought to check out? Oh man, something that others should check out. Well, I did go watch Dune recently. It was quite good. What did you think about it in relation to Dune One? Did what, what did you? How'd you feel about one versus two? It's a continuum. They did a very good job between splitting the difference between the two of those. I mean, the book is a doorstop. It's this big. So, you know, to make that into one movie, one going to happen. No, I think they, I think they melded the two together really well. Um, I think, I think those are very, it was a very well shot, very cinematic piece. It was very enjoyable. Um, How long was it? Cause the first one's long two and a half hours. So the whole thing I think is about five hours and change. Okay. Okay. I feel like it could go for six and a half. I feel like there's, there's, yeah. there's more there's that more. can be done there. Well, I mean, it's the book is, I mean, and Frank Herbert's a genius. It's hard to believe when you read it. It was written in the sixties. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, 
But on, on point, there are several Black Mirror episodes that I think people should watch. Um, I know that's a little out of field, but if you go to Netflix and start skimming through, there are several that are very topically oriented about what happens when hyper-connectivity exists and hyper-AIs take over and what does that look like? And I think that gives would give the listener a good frame of reference of what could happen. Right. Yeah, it's going to be the negative case. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's yeah. actually something quite, quite the positive where you okay. figure out the ability to upload the human consciousness and live on forever. Right. So there, there are positive cases, and then there's the social credit score, right, right. which is basically a digital version of what we think of you as right. a person holistically. And what happens when that's driven by an organization? Um, yeah. I think those are very interesting thought provoking to if you don't have a frame of reference from an entertainment perspective to kind of attain one. Okay. Very good. Very good. Well, Steven, that's all I've got. Uh, I will stop there and let you get back to it. Thanks uh, for being on cut the shit. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple podcasts and Spotify, That would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on TikTok, at CutTheShitPod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel, at Plow Networks. Until next time, take care and have a great day.